What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Archangels Media. It's good to see you again. Uh, today, I, I am a little bit late. Sorry for that. I've been busy all day. Um, I hope you guys are having a good day. Um, and uh, Cornell has got, you know, some good news, I guess. He uh, had his... Never mind. Yep. Okay. So... <laughs> <laughs> that being said, um, or not said, uh, <laughs> Cornell, save it, man. Save it. <laughs> Personal life, YouTube life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've won every sound. Okay, I hear you. <laughs> so, anyways, that being said, I'm uh I'm I'm I am a little uncomfortable with this book. Yeah. It is it is making my trad flame agitated, right? Um and I don't know I I don't know why I'm so agitated by this trad fame because I really, really like the way the Nicaean and I see in Faith Volumes want to do. I think it's a great, you know, survey of history. And there's just, you know, I, I, the book this last week I felt like it was making me a little uncomfortable, right? And this week I feel even more uncomfortable about it than last week, right? Um, and, and I don't know, maybe this is just a me thing, you know? Um, but uh, today he's, he's talking about the Virgin Mary. Some of this stuff is mystical and something that I think that St. Simeon, uh, the new theologian, would have been like right on about, right? You know? But it also seems like he's suggesting that the language of the church should not be taken literally, right? Or that we should, I, I don't know, right? Like, uh, like, 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 like these are later theological proclamations that may not be historical, perhaps. Um, don't know, I don't know what to do about that. But before we jump in, because I do want to hear what you have to say. Um, before we jump in, it's our last poll, dude. Yeah, last poll. Last poll. It's up. Yeah, which which means uh, next week uh, we'll be done reading Father John Bears uh, on the mystery of Christ. Yeah. So that went by fast. So yeah. if you're just joining in, this is chapter four of that book. If mm -hmm. you're watching, so um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is the last week. So the two that won out were um, on the uh, incarnation by Saint Athanasius, and nihilism by Father Seraphim Rose. Now, what's interesting here is we have this problem where people are voting; more people are voting on one poll than the other. So this time, fifty votes. Last time, you know. Uh, this has 50 votes and 53 votes. So when you vote, make sure. Well, I guess it's not really. Yeah, there's only going to be one. Yeah, poll. there's only one poll now. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, yeah so this is sudden death uh, at this point. So. Right. Right. This is for this is for it all, and it's between. Um, it's it's on Rose. the uh, on the incarnation and uh, uh, Sarah from Rose's book Nihilism. Yeah. So I guess the option is between a universally recognized saint and a locally recognized saint from the Georgian church recently canonized. So, um, <laughs> so that being said, I'm very excited. Um, either one of those I think is going to be good. I, I really enjoyed Seraphim Rios's uh, book on St. Augustine uh, when I saw that a long time ago. So, um, And then do you want to do a separate, you know what, um, I'm going to send you a Tell me a little bit about what you think about the book, man. So far. What? Tell me what you thought about it. Do you just kind of do you feel the same kind of uneasiness that I do or no? Um I think he's just I think he is walking a, a tightrope in a lot of instances. Um like the idea that um evil is sort of necessary in Irenaeus. Like to me, that's just like a no for me. Like, yeah. No, mm -hmm. it isn't necessary. Right. Um, and, and I think that needs to be pretty clear. Um, so just to kind of recap on three. Um, and then, of course, chapters one and two. Um, again, he's talking about, well, when we're looking hindsight 2020, right? 
Um, and so I don't know if that's what he means by necessary in that when we look um, behind, we try to make sense of things, right? Yeah. And um, I don't know if he would say, yeah, evil is necessary or not. He does have this other book on death and death as our, as our last kind of teacher. Right. So maybe that's something where we could get further clarity from Father John Barron. He, he just has a few. He doesn't write the whole book. There's other contributors in that. Um, it's called what the role of death and life or something or. Okay. I have it. Um, I'll go find it. Let's see father John there. Can you hear that uh, car alarm going off by the way? Barely. But yes. Yeah. I was going to say um, I, the role of death and life is what it's called. Okay. Yeah, so he, he might go in a little more detail on that, on evil and death. As, huh. But my, my, my thought is maybe he does see evil as sort of this necessary element to bring about this um, incomprehensible good that we just can't quite understand. Right. So it's interesting. He, you know, This book is called The Mystery of Christ, Life in Death. Right. And now he's saying the role of death in life, life and death, death in life. He's doing something here. Um, and it's obviously intentional. Um, I don't know. Yeah. So there's that. I thought his, you know, take on understanding um, everything in light of Christ as like an experience, a phenomenon that you encounter, then that then shapes your understanding of scripture from there, but something that you can't get until Christ comes. That strikes right. me as true. Um, so right. in that sense, I like Father John Bear. Um, but this um, necessary evil thing, I think is probably my biggest critique from a philosophical standpoint, I think that's a bad move. Mm. Um, and then this section on Mary, um, again, I, I, I just, I, I think he is, um, I, I think maybe you might have more angst with it than I do. Okay. Um, yeah. Because um, I don't know if you just want to get into the chapter, then we can kind of flesh it out. On one yep. Point. Yeah. Yep. Hey, yep. let me let me close this where I, I got some noise coming in. Okay. So okay. let me let me be right back. Oh. Okay. Um. Yeah. So chapter four is entitled uh, "The Virgin Mother," right? And um. <laughs> He is drawing parallels between the Virgin Mary and the church. Uh, and this, this whole drawing parallels thing is, is great. In fact, he draws several parallels. He talks about uh, Mary Magdalene as well. And just really the believer who receives the word, right? And so, uh, oh man, there's, just, there's a lot to go on here. But he starts out by saying that the gospel... Uh, is always proclaimed connected to the idea of of a birth, right? So you have the birth of Christ, uh, and then you have the new birth of the believer, right? The Apostle Paul talks about, you know, uh, you have m had many teachers, but you have not had many fathers, right? For I begot you, right, in the faith. Um, and, you know, also you have the Apostle John referring to people as my little children, right? Um, and I think we do even see this idea of a begot Christ in you, right? And so this idea is like the person who receives the word of God, right, is uh, correlating, I guess, to Mary receiving the word of God, right? So she accepts um, the archangel's, uh, Gabriel's message, she affirms it, and so she receives the word of God, and the word of God becomes incarnate in her, in her own flesh. 
And um, this is something that St. Simon the New Theologian talks about, right? And he also, uh, he even says, like, yes, um, you do become, in a sense, a Theotokos. Not in the literal sense, the way that the Virgin Mary was, right? But in another sense in which, you know, Christ is born within you. And I think that that's, that's uh, good. And I think that's solid. I think that's uh, fantastic, right? Um, um yeah. So, what, what do you what do you have to say about that, man? Yeah. Um, just kind of going through this chapter. Um, I, it, one thing that it reminded me of. Um, there's this. It's a newer book. I believe it's called "The Power of Patristic Preaching." Let me see if I can mm -hmm. pull that up. Um, power of Patristic Preaching. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the power of patristic preaching. I'll put it in the chat here, so if you want to pull it up. Okay. But um, this kind of gave me some memories of this when I was reading it. Okay. Um, the power of patristic preaching. Let me hit my present button here. Share screen. Yeah, just something to keep on people's radar. This got published earlier this year. Actually, okay. Actually, did buy Andrew this. Hoffer? I actually, did uh, purchase this for my priest because I just thought it was interesting. Um, yeah. But it goes through different um, church fathers and goes to like a homily and talks about how by preaching the word, the word becomes uh, pregnant, like Mary right. was pregnant with the word by receiving the word. And right. so these are just kind of examples of how the word was impregnant in Christians, you know, maybe going through different, um, you know, different aspects in the Christian life and how we can, you know, give birth to Christ in our own lives, essentially is the idea. Right. Right? And so I, I think this all kind of goes together, this hearing language of how you hear the word and then that's how you receive the word and become kind of pregnated with the word. So it, it's very comfortable using this sort of language, of okay. receiving um, the word in that way. And so, so in a way, we're, we're all kind of like Mary and receiving the word. So this gentleman, Reverend Andrew Hoffer, OP, I don't know what OP stands for. Um, He's a Dominican. Oh. Ordinary Professor of Patristics and Ancient Languages. So he teaches ancient languages and patristics, okay? Um, he's got a PhD from Notre Dame, um, an MDiv, of course, Master's of Literature, BA, Benedictine College. So uh, this guy's pretty impressive. He's a Roman Catholic fellow. Um, and I, I find it interesting. I'm, I'm reading this. This name keeps popping up, Barkley. Uh, or Cornell, I uh, <laughs> I um, I keep seeing this. Uh, origin is popping up everywhere, dude, and it's only because I've been hanging out with you. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> so it says here, this book is inspired by this question preached by Origin. For what does it profit if I should say that Jesus has come in the flesh alone, which he received from Mary, and I should not show also that he has come in this flesh of mine? It's beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and that's actually a lot of, that's kind of what uh, John Bear is uh, talking about um, here as well. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of what the, the book reminded me of. I just read the first, like, two chapters of the book. Um, I didn't read the full book, but right. Um, right. so. So, yeah, this uh, this idea of um, giving birth, right? Yeah. Um, is throughout this and Mary is a type and uh, and I think maybe how heavy of the emphasis he puts on type is what maybe you're uncomfortable with right well I mean I think it's I think and, and I don't want to accuse him of this because he's a priest right um, but it seems like he's saying that the Virgin birth is a later theological 
um, articulation, uh, but it should not be confused with the historical one, right? Um, and not just the virgin birth, but also things like her being sinless. And um, I don't know if I'm just reading the text wrong or if I'm just suspicious. I don't know. Um, but it, it, sometimes it feels like he's saying is like, well, maybe she, he, he doesn't say this in the book. He does not say maybe she wasn't a virgin. He does not say maybe she wasn't sinless. Right. But this emphasis that this is a leader, a later theological um, development, uh, development or a later theological um, uh, application, I guess. I don't know. Right? I think I think he does the same thing for recognition of Jesus being um, the Son of God and the second person of the Trinity as well, though, in the sense of how Jesus is remembered only afterward, right. and um, has a lot to do with maybe he's just that sort of dehistoricizing, like he's not interested mm -hmm. in trying to get to the concrete historical reality. He's wanting to get to the spiritual um, meat, if you will, of how it was remembered. Um, yeah. So I think he was doing. Yeah. So I guess my I guess what I'm trying to say though is like you, you use the word meat. I like that meat, right? Um, what I'm saying is that if there isn't a historical virgin birth and a historical sinless Mary, right? Then. Um, then there is no meat. You know what I mean? There's nothing to bite into. You're biting into like, uh, I don't know, uh, a squeaky toy. You know, it's empty on the inside. You know? Um, yeah. So that's that's what I'm concerned about. I don't I don't think he actually believes that, but that's that's what I'm reading in the book, and it makes me feel skeevish. I think it's just more of a methodology of his emphasis, like, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I, uh, that's what I think. I think it's more of emphasis mm -hmm. on, on his method and how we should also think in the ways that they thought we should come to receive, um, these traditions in the same way that they did, right. um, mm -hmm. is what he's trying to encourage you to maybe flip a switch in your head from, yeah. Um, this historical critical method, and then accept that this is a legitimate way to understand um, scripture. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But that that's my sort of defense. I I, I think this is just more of an issue of um, him not seeing this as an issue at all. Like we should be comfortable. And I, and I think maybe some of that has to do with the Enlightenment, maybe, that um, where we want to emphasize the things the way we do. And, like, I, I just don't think that's how they thought, you know? Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I just want to loudly and clearly affirm things like the Son of Sister Mary and, you know, and – uh yeah, perpetual I, virgin and stuff like that. Yeah, but like, 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 like you said, he doesn't say that that's not the case. He's not denying any of that, right? It's just, yeah. yeah, there's a certain methodology that maybe it's just that it's foreign. You know what I mean? The de emphasis on, on history uh, seems foreign to me because I've spent my whole life doing apologetics on this is why you can believe that the historical Jesus, the Jesus, the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith are the same and you know, um, that Jesus truly did rise from the dead. And here's this system of history, you know, things like um, the criterion of embarrassment and things like that, that point to and indicate that Christ truly did rise from the dead, right? Mm -hmm. And cementing that as a historical claim. Um, and maybe what he's trying to say is that's not the primary lens of the Christian focus, right? The primary lens of the Christian focus, focus is going to be more mystical. Yeah. So I think um, the Isaiah 54 passage is a good one to go to. Sure. Um, Seeing go barren one who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. 
you who have been in travail. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her that is married, says the Lord. Um, and then this kind of goes in with uh, Revelation chapter 12, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Where there's this queen of heaven who has a child. Then you find that they're being chased. Um, and of course, yeah. there's protection there. And then this is going after her children, right? Yeah. Even though at first it only explains one child at the right. beginning of the chapter. It's only at the end of the chapter that you see all the children. Yeah, uh, it's it's awkward to me when people look at that as the church and not as the Theotokos. Um, and, I, and I suppose that the, the, the lady is the church and the Theotokos, right? I guess maybe that's the best way of saying it. But um it's just awkward to me, I guess, because um, um, I don't know. I had I had I had a line of thought that just crashed. Well, I, and it's not awkward just to just you. I've I've heard other you know scholars say the same thing. Um, right. To say just try to point this to the church only, and um, when I was reading his um, John's Paschal Gospel, okay. Um, it seemed to me he he didn't point to Mary as the queen of heaven there. It was the church. Right. That's, that's kind of what I got from him. I'm going off memory, so I could be wrong. But when I was reading that, it seems like, nope, this isn't Mary. This is the church. Um, but there, there, are, there are others who um, would say that, that that's kind of a weird claim because it just seems so obvious that it is Mary when you're reading it, the text. So I don't know if you want to throw Revelation 12 up and so that people can see it themselves. No doubt, dude. Let's do it. But I, I do think um, John Bear actually has some really good connections with uh, Revelation 12 with other passages in John and then, of course, here in Isaiah 54. Um, um. Why are all of my stuff like foreign languages? Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. like, that's Latin. That's that's Greek. That's more Greek. That's more Latin. <laughs> all right. Um, so, and a great sign. Can you see this? I can't. Doesn't need to be zoom in. I'm, I'm gonna zoom in. Sure. Here we go. And a great sign appeared in heaven: a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant, was crying out in birth pangs an agony of giving birth and another sign appeared in heaven behold a great dragon great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems and his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast him to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who's about to give birth so that she that so that when she bore her child he might devour it i see that as re referring to herod right trying to kill jesus um, she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she was as place, has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. That's three and a half years. Um, I've heard that this is how old, how long Jesus uh, stayed in Egypt, right? Um, because they went to Egypt, and then I guess when he was three and a half years old, they left Egypt. Out of Egypt, I've called my son. Um, I don't know if that's what it means here, but I've seen theological talk about that. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angel fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. There was no longer any peace for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, and he, was cast, and he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, you who dwell in them. I want to talk about this right here, even unto death. Uh, rejoice, O heavens, uh, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O 
earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time, and a time, and half a time. That's uh, two and a half years. The serpent, again, wow, two and a half years again? A time and a time and a half, and half a time? Um, this is the way that Daniel talks about it in Daniel chapter 9, right? A time and a time and a half a time, right? Um, but normally he, he says it three times, right? Three and a half years. But this is two and a half years. So, yeah, just kind yeah. of to draw the connection, though, with uh, the ver- Mary and the church, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Just but, to, sorry, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot that can be talked about here. I know, I, mean, I know, I know. I mean, my bad. On, on, honestly, there's, there's, there's a whole... Yeah, maybe yeah. maybe Archangel's Media should do a uh, a uh, a reading on Revelation. Um, <laughs> but the earth came to the power uh, came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the rat that the dragon had poured from his mouth. And then the dragon became furious with the woman, and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, and those who keep the commandments of God and the hold of the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, definitely, like what what Father John Bear does is make connection to the church as the one that is the bride of Christ, right? Um, she's definitely the one that is taken from the side when he's pierced on the cross, right. the water and the blood that flows um, creates the church from his side, just like. Adam um, created Eve from his side. So the church is the second Eve. Mm -hmm. And what he's trying to say is that the church is the archetype. And Mary is a type of the church. And not the, not the reverse. Um. And here you, you get a sense of, well, Mary is in John's gospel witnessing the um, crucifixion of Jesus. And it, there's a passage about being in travail uh, earlier in John's gospel where Mary's in travail. And, and it's at that point when Jesus uh, passes that she has then given birth to Jesus, and that's in um, it's in Father John Bear's uh, John's Paschal Gospel. It's at right. that moment when um, it's finished, right? The first man has been made, and so right. this is talking about man in the sense of completion. So the completed man, right? And what what Adam should have always been. Is completed, and um, so when Jesus tells Mary, uh, "Behold your son," to um, John, and John, "Behold your mother," um, he's making that connection that all those who are in Christ, follow Christ, and love Christ, um, that are near to His cross, will have Mary as their mother too, right. And so that's where it's sort of hard, but I, I do think this connection of type and archetype is probably um, appropriate. But I'm just wondering if maybe um, it it sort of limits the our understanding of Mary as as a larger role. You know what I mean? Right. Right. And I, I would say maybe that's that's my um, that's my concern. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I, I do. I do want to talk about the shepherd because I thought out of yeah. everything that was um, said here, we read. I mean, we these are not new concepts to us, right? We've seen this in 
St. Simeon, uh, the new theologian, most of these concepts, right? And we've hashed them over there. Um, but I always liked the um, the Shepherd of Hermes. I never actually read it. I always wanted to read it. I probably should read it. Um, have you read it before? Yeah. You have? It's okay. been a while. I, I, I don't remember everything. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a longer letter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's what's a vision, right? These are a series of visions, right? And so um, I like this this idea that in the beginning of the Shepherd of Hermes, right, you have this old woman, right? And then the woman gets younger and younger and younger until the very end. And the only way that you know that the that this is the same woman is that even though she's younger, hair is white. You know what I mean? Um uh, but th so this is the church, right? So the church is this old woman, and um, she has always existed. Um, she's somehow eternal in some way. Um, she's the first created, I believe, is what it says. Yeah, yeah, the first created, right? Yeah, it's Hermas, her Shepherd of Hermas. Right, right. Um, uh, and so she's so she's kind of always existed, uh, at least since the beginning of the creation. Right. It's it's sort of like this uh, Benjamin Buttons type thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know? Exactly. So, so starts out old and gets younger, and um, and the idea is that by the time she's young enough, she appears as um, as a bride, as a virgin bride. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there is something to be said. I, you know, I uh, keep coming to this passage. In um, Second Ezra, um, let me see here. I think it's either chapter fourteen or fifteen. Um, I mean, chapter fifteen. You have this interesting thing, this idea, and actually, the Jews still hold to this idea that the world was created for the Jews, right? That it was created for them. That the whole reason why the um, uh, that God created anything, right, was so that um, the Jews would exist and inherit everything, right? Um, let me see here. Let me look at this. Uh, am I still projecting? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So. Sword. All right. Um, one of the, one of the things uh, did you got it pulled up? Uh, no, go ahead. Okay. Well, one of the things that um, is in this vision is um, the church is seen as this tower, right? Um, and it's built out of stones, but in the stones, it's almost as if it was just one slab of stone. Mm -hmm. There is no uh, seams in the tower. Um, so it's almost like this perfectly built tower out of one stone. So any cracked or, you know, any sort of imperfect stone would have been uh, rejected out of it. And this kind of brought me, well, made me think of that, the language that we see in uh, Corinthians about... Um, providing material to build the church, you know, what were you building it out of wood or hay, or um, are you providing precious stones and metals that are useful? Um, and if not, those things are going to be burnt up, right? It's not going to provide anything. It's not going to contribute to um, what's being built, right? It's sort of like this temple imagery, right? You can help build the temple or not. Right. And, um, so that I kind of drew a connection there with the Shepherd of Hermas in that sense. So the, the idea that the church is a perfect thing. So you see the, the virgin that is without blemish. Um, the, 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 the lamb as well. Perfect spotless. Um, uh, bridesmaid dress with, you know, without spot. Um, mm -hmm. All these sorts of metaphors that are being used to talk about the church um yeah. 
you see that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I can't find it for now, man. Um, sure. We can pull well, up later. We, yep. Um, anyways. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I like that 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 whole imagery of the of, of the woman. It also kind of reminds me of um, what Father Stephen DeYoung and Father Andrew Stephen Damick were talking about, where um, in one of the Lord of the Spirits uh, pod, uh, podcasts, where it's he seemed to suggest that they're the Christians are able to hasten the return of Christ, right? Are able to hasten the uh, the turn the return of Christ by means of our, I guess, evangelism or good works or you know whatever. Um, and this idea that this you know that Christ is wanting a a perfect bride, right? And this this idea that the perfect bride does not exist yet. Right, that this 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 uh, this virgin, um, this virgin bride, that um, that is referenced here. John Bear says this is a future uh, a vision of the future church, right? Not the church as she is. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes well with Simeon when he says uh, the reason why Christ hasn't came yet is because um, all those whom he has called hasn't yet been born. Right. Yeah. And so I think that's part of this is those whom Christ has in his mind to save has not yet, um, you know, been born. So yeah. Um, yeah. to me, that those are similar ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's look at this martyrdom account. Oh, wait, you know what? Let's look at Clement first, because you and I, uh, we read Clement. What was it last week that we read Clement, second Clement? Yeah, this is a different Clement, though. Are you, or which one are you looking at? Is it Clement of Alexander or of Alexandria? Yeah. Is it a different Clement? Uh, it says second epistle of Clement. So I think this okay. is. What page from, are you on? This is on page 120. Okay, so 123 has a different Clement. Oh, okay. Okay, my yeah, you're fine. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we read that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he says, um, the idea that the church pre-exists creation is also found in the second epistle of Clement. He says, brethren, if we do the will of our Father God, we shall belong to the first church, the spiritual one, which was created before the sun and moon. Um, which is, you know, pretty early. The sun and the moon were created on the fourth day, right? Um, the epistle continues by... Uh, interpreting the statement that God made man male and female as referring to Christ and the church. This is, uh, this is something that um, even St. Simeon refers to um, with Ephesians, right? Where um, the apostle Paul says, for this a reason it is written that a man shall leave his wife or leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife. Mm -hmm. And then he says, um, uh, this was written about the church, right? I, I tell you this great mystery that this is written about the church. Um, it says here, uh, the books and the apostles declare that the church belongs not to the present, but has existed from the beginning, for she was spiritual, as also was our Jesus, but was made manifest in the last days that he, or more likely she, might save us. And the church, which is spiritual, was made manifest in the flesh of Christ, showing us that if any one of us guard her in the flesh without corruption, he shall again, he shall receive a back again in the Holy Spirit. Um, now, this for this passage for here it says, or more likely, she is that Clement writing that, or is that something that he's inserting into the quotation? Let me find that where it says that. 121. Mm hmm. I think maybe Father John Bears is inserting she. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Let's see. It's footnote number six. Let's see if he clarifies the back. Nope, he doesn't. He does not clarify it? No, but it could be the translator adding that. Cake Lake. Mm -hmm. Not Father John Bear. Okay. Yeah. 
I don't know. Mm. Um, yeah, but mm. I mean, it's pretty common to refer to the church as feminine, not masculine. So. Right, 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 right. Well, the question is that who is the one doing the saving? And of course, it's a it's a it's a false dichotomy, right? Yeah, but, you're but, saved in the you're saved in the church, by it, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. But the fact that it says um, more or more likely she, right, makes me feel like they're pitting them against each other. Yeah. yeah. So, so one thing I'd say, like, one, one of my takeaways, if I can, I feel like anyone, I mean, unless you're just, like, extremely closed off and fundamentalist, I feel like anyone could read this chapter if you're Protestant and agree with it. Yeah. Like, I don't see anything in here that you could take away and have qualms with in the way it talks about Mary. Um, mm -hmm. Just recognizing this typology. Mm -hmm. um, like, I, am I being too... Um, yeah. Am I assuming too much about our about Protestants here and their willingness to... Yeah. Um, be open to Mary because I, I just don't see anything here that I feel like he makes pretty clear um, this idea of typology and, and that and I think that's maybe what you were saying you're perhaps uncomfortable with well I'm not I'm not upset about the typology at all I just it seemed like he was trying to de-emphasize history and um, mm -hmm. you know that's the only thing that I was really concerned about everything else as far as the typology um, and everything else just seemed solid and was, was good. I just, I thought that he was doing this weird line dance about whether or not we can say these things as a matter of history. I really, I really liked 127. I mean, there, maybe I'm skipping some things that I liked here, but, mm -hmm. um, this, uh, Mary sitting still at Jesus's feet and hearing his word. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is. Um, this devotion, Luke 10, um, 38 through 42. So he, he says, what well, contrast Martha's busy service. So there's, there's Mary and Martha and Mary's just sitting still at Jesus' feet and hearing his word. But the reading then concludes with a verse taken from halfway through the following chapter. Um, as he spoke these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that you sucked. Uh, but he said, blessed rather are those that hear the gospel and keep it. And then he says, um, it's interesting, but the gospels present no one else as keeping the word of God in a pure heart apart from Mary, the mother of Jesus. Yes. So he's saying, yeah, but really the one that you want to um, imitate. Imitate is the one who, 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 you know, keeps my word. And in fact, well, that's Mary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, those who would want to point this verse out and say, well, see, he's de-emphasizing Mary. Right. Well, really, the author is saying, well, actually, Mary's the one who's doing this. Right, right. Good point. Mm -hmm. And um, just sort of a, I, I think that's a really good um, note to make because it's such a, popular verse that's appealed to you see that right. one and then well those you know you want to know who my my mother and my brother and my sister are is those who keep my word or keep my commandments right right and it's like okay well mary did that <laughs> right no. um yeah i think um i really like what he does later about um we had talked about how the beloved disciple who stands by the foot of the cross right? That's not necessarily John, right? I mean, it might might be John, right? Or, or, or it's specifically that the beloved disciple is anyone who is not ashamed of the cross, right? Right? Anyone who's willing to go to the cross with Christ. Um, and it says, uh, he says, um, he says, by Christ's own words, his mother is now the mother of the beloved disciple. And this disciple is himself identified with Christ because the woman says, or Christ says, behold your son, right? And, and that's and that's where the other children are born in Revelation 12. 
Right, because you're it, in Christ. That 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 is sort of the birth pangs that give birth to the new children is through the cross. Right. That's right. where the women are in travail or where the woman is in travail is is the cross. At the foot of the cross. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it says that uh, those who stand by the cross and are not ashamed of it receive as their mother the one who embodies this, this fertile, generative faithfulness, and they themselves become sons of God, for they have Christ, the Son of God, living in them. You know, mm -hmm. good, solid. Yeah. You were talking about the Christ being the milk? <laughs> yeah, you wanted to talk about this. And whenever I, whenever I think of milk, <laughs> I, not whenever I think about any milk, right? But I'm always brought back to that um, that Psalm of Solomon, you know? Yep. You too? Well, thanks to you. <laughs> o Odes of Solomon and the... Yep. The father being milked. Hey, Jeremiah. God bless you, man. Whole, I appreciate you. Is it Christ as the cup or is Christ the milk? Uh, in that analogy. I'll go find I, it. I again. think Christ is the cup in the analogy. Yeah. And the milk is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Jeremiah. Um, yeah. Odes of Solomon. Um, uh, well, while you're looking that up, I'll just yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this. So this is from Clement of Alexandria, so uh, pretty early testimony. You know, Clement of Alexandria predates Origen, um, so that's like second century. Um, and he says, "There is one Father of all. There is one Word of all, and the Holy Spirit is one and the same everywhere." So you got a nice little Trinity early on. And there yep. is also one Virgin Mother, whom I love to call the Church. Alone, this mother had no milk because she alone did not become a woman. She is virgin and mother simultaneously, a virgin mm -hmm. undefiled and a mother full of love. She yeah. draws her children to herself and nurses them with holy milk. That is the word for infants. She had not milk because the milk was this child, beautiful mm -hmm. and familiar, the body of Christ. So because she actually um, didn't cause the child um to be born right this is something miraculous right um she doesn't have milk and oh she doesn't have breast okay yeah 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 yeah, 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 so, yeah, so, yeah but yet she is a virgin mother full of love undefiled so it's to be a virgin and be a mother is a weird thing right so she's a virgin and a mother and the milk is the body of Christ and um i, I don't know if it's here but there, there is church tradition where um, after baptism, they would provide milk. And honey. And honey. No, he, he talks about this. Yeah, actually. Okay. He does. He does specifically say that. That milk and honey. Actually, I think it's, what page are you on? They give him a little cup of milk and honey. I'm yeah. on, I mean, I'm on 120, uh, 125, bottom of 125. Yeah, 125. Um, let me see here. Yeah, here it is. It's on a page of 124, right? Um, oh, yeah. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll milk has the... Eucharistic overtones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so she had not milk because the milk was this child, beautiful and familiar, the body of Christ. The fruit of the virgin here is Christ, not simply, however, as the one to whom she gives birth, but as her milk, the milk by which she nourishes those for whom she is mother. Again, there is a suggestion that the church already existed a virgin waiting to become a mother while yet preserving her virginity. It is possible that the image of milk has Eucharistic overtones for there were Christians who used milk and sometimes with honey and their ritual meals often connected with baptism. You know, you know what I've never done before? Mixed milk and honey and drink it. Yeah. Have you? No. Yeah. See, and maybe, maybe we'll go get a cow and you get your bees. I got my bees. Yeah, I can go find. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can do that. You got fresh yeah. honey right there. I do. Yeah, uh, I do have fresh honey. It's awesome. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, this very interesting. The whole I'll lead you into a land of milk and honey, you know, um, and how the early Christians would do would would eat that. Also, I hear a big one was uh, 
fish. You know, people would eat fish because Christ is the um, yeah, the ichthus, right? The Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior. Um, you know, I I nah, I, I don't want to get into that. Actually, I don't want to. <laughs> I almost wonder because we talk about how there's diversity of rites, right? Um, there's there's different um, Eucharistic canons and things like that, just different liturgies. Um, and potentially there could have been a time when, you know, the baptism in the name of Jesus was simultaneously happening um, with baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? Um, that's a potent, that, that's potentially there, right? And so I almost wonder if there were ever, I, I don't want to use the word competing rites, right? But different elements apart from body and, Apart from bread and wine that were used in Eucharistic celebrations, like honeycomb and milk, as, like this one's talking about, or fish and bread, right? Because you have the fish and the bread in the Gospels, you know what I mean, which prefigure the Eucharist. Is it only that they prefigured, or were Christians ever actually using these as part of the Eucharistic meal? I don't know enough about what the love feast consisted of, because... Mm -hmm the development of coming forward to a callus with bread and wine was a development yeah. um, before there was a full feast. And yeah. um, I don't know what that is. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if anybody knows, to be honest. Does anyone really know what that would have looked like, a love feast? Right. Um, I mean, we, we know that it was more fuller. We, we know this because in um, – was it the Church of Galatia, where, it, or or was it James, where where there's a separation, and it seems as though like there there are some that are really enjoying their meal, and there's others that are just like scraps, and they're barely getting anything, and it's there's sort of an injustice in the love feast on um, based on who's eating what and how much or how good it is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, there, there's an inequality in the love feast, right? And right. Um, that that was an issue, really. right? Yeah, in the Corinthian church, yeah, 100%. yeah, yeah. Is it the Corinthian church that was that yeah. this happening? Yeah, there this was, is First Corinthians chapter twelve. I'm thinking of Galatians for some reason, uh, where mm -hmm. Cephas, i.e., Paul, um, is uh, or Peter is being confronted right yeah but that was for the, over uh, table fellowship yeah it was over ta table fellowship but i thought you were talking about in first corinthians where it talks about um there there is the a old, there is yeah. a sort of an apartheid type segregation occurring between jews and shins house with table fellowship but i also think of what is at the table there's a there's yeah. an actual inequality yeah, I, I remember the apostle paul saying something like this i was like don't you have bread at home don't you have food at home or did you have meat at home something like that yeah um do you all have houses <laughs> yeah 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 um let me see here i don't i don't need to necessarily try to find it but yeah i believe that's in first corinthians that that, that was an issue um was also an issue with uh, James, right? In the gospel, yeah, in the epistle of James, That's he talks about wealthy people. Yeah, you know, um, you know. So um, th th there is this love feast that happened that we just don't do, right? And um, well, we do. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do for sure. Well, we for have our, <laughs> what I mean is that we have our we have our. Um, coffee hour every every week or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's just not the the way they understood that meal. I believe was um, the whole meal was Eucharistic. Am I wrong in understanding that? Oh, I don't know. I can't. I, 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 I think know. they understood the whole feast to be a Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Wow, not just the uh, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, we'll have to take a look at that. That, yeah. that that would be something worth exploring to find out what's you know what's going on there you know I, I could be wrong but I mean even then the way that they were partaking it with Jesus and the, and the disciples it was mm -hmm. it was a meal yeah yeah I, either way it was a full meal it wasn't just uh um not just the, not just the bread and the wine yeah not just the yeah not not, not a one time yeah just not just a one time 
there it is next. It was more of a full thing. And that doesn't mean that it's it's wrong. Uh, the development, it's it's um, you know, it, uh, it's not to be yeah. understood that way. Just there was a development. Right. Right. Well, I found it. <laughs> Odes. Oh, so, oh, nice. huh. so, O19, right? So, the whole milk thing, right? We're talking about milk. All right. Um, got milk. Yeah, got milk. Um, so, he says, uh, All right. Um, a cup of wine, a, mu- a cup of milk. I always want to say wine. A cup of milk was offered to me, and I drank it in the sweetness of the delight of the Lord. The sun is the cup. And he who was milked is the father and the Holy Spirit milked him because his breasts were full and it was necessary for him that his milk should be sufficiently released. And the Holy Spirit opened his bosom and mingled the milk uh, from the two breasts of the father and gave the mixture to the world without their knowing. And they who receive in it, it's full and they who receive in its fullness are the ones on the right hand. And the spirit opened the womb of the virgin and she conceived and she received conception and brought forth and the virgin became a mother with many mercies. I like this, this idea that mother has many mercies, mm-hmm. right? Which is sort of like uh, the whole full of grace thing um, that we see, right? She's a mother of many mercies uh, and she travailed and brought forth a son without incurring pain. Which is interesting. This idea of, yeah, yeah, but the idea of travailing, and and not having pain in your travail. Yeah, th- th- I mean, this is again connected with a uh, woman in travail and in, in the Gospel of John, yep. and in Revelation twelve. Yep. Um, yep. And then also this idea of milk and yep. um, Clement of Alexandria. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Clement of Alexandria had this, this text in mind. For sure, 100%. Uh, and because she was not sufficiently prepared, and she had not sought a midwife, for he brought her to bear, she brought forth as if, as if she were a man of her own will. And she brought him forth openly and acquired him with great dignity and loved him in his swaddling clothes and guarded him kindly and showed him in majesty. Hallelujah. Swaddling clothes. He's got something very interesting to say about the swaddling clothes. Um, uh, particularly when he's talking about the icon, right? Of the nativity. And uh, let me pull that up real quick. This, uh, the icon of the nativity. Um, all right. Images. Here we go. And here we are. Uh, open link a new window. Here we go. So here we are, nativity. Okay. Now there's a few things that uh, that are happening in this. Okay. Um, number one, we have the Holy Ghost descending, right? And there's two. There's three prongs in the Holy Ghost, right? Are coming off of him, um, and the middle one is pointing directly to Christ, and so they see this idea of the incarnation of the Word, right? Um, and where is Jesus laid? Now, look at this that is a manger, but it is not only a manger, man, that is a sarcophagus, mm-hmm. right? The way that that is shaped, that is 100% a, sarcoph- a sarcophagus. Okay, and the clothes that he's wrapped in are burial clothes, right? And this is what uh, Father John Bear points out in the book, right? That he, and he's so on the one hand he's he's in a manger, right? And the animals come and they eat from the manger, right? Because they're, um, I mean, that's where the food is, right? And so Christ is the idea; he is the bread, right? And then you have this idea that no, this is also sarcophagus because he's come to die. And he's wrapped in swaddling clothes, right? And um, I love, I love how he's always depicted. I mean, that is a man. Do you see that? I mean, it's a baby, but that's a man because he's got a 
uh, a hairline already, very masculine hairline, um, you know, and it's thick and stuff like that. So also you see this uh, imagery of Joseph, right, um, being an old man, right? Mm -hmm. So, and this over here, what's interesting is that some icons, this woman is bathing Christ, right? But that's not really what's supposed to be happening. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Here it is. Oof, not a great picture. But you see how this lady is holding her hand into the water and the other lady is pouring the water on top of it? Probably got to blow it up a little more. Um, let me see. Can you... Oh, you, are, you guys aren't seeing what I'm seeing. Um, pen by I see the page. Yeah. Okay, pen by Theron Fuller. Do you see this? Okay, I do now. Okay, all right. Um, did you see what I was pointing to about the sarcophagus and stuff, or no? Yeah, you did see that stuff. Okay. Yeah. So this is another depiction here, where in the other depiction, there's the the woman is bathing Christ, right? And this one, he's holding Christ. She's holding Christ. But this, this, she's got her hand in the water. And the reason she's got her hand in the water, okay, is because if you read the infancy gospel of, um, the, you know, the, pro, the, the proto evangelium of James, right? Um, this is the midwife. And the midwife is sent to check her virginity because she's heard that a virgin has conceived, right? And, um, and this this virgin has conceived, and she just doesn't believe it. And she goes, okay, well, I'll go check. Well, let me check. And so she goes and she checks, and her hand is immediately engul engulfed in fire, right? She immediately starts burning, and she starts plunging her hand into the water. And so that's what's going on in this icon. Hmm. You know? And I think he even references uh, the midwife checking um, her virginity. Um, which by the way, my wife gets angry every time she hears that story, you know, she's like, how dare you, you know? Um, anyways, I thought that was, I thought that was worth talking about a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Oh, it's good. Yeah. Um, I thought it was just kind of on a, a totally different basis. The 135, um, yep. just the way that they talk about the, how December 25th became the date of Christmas, which is relevant. Right, the nine months thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. Um, is that commonly known? Yeah, well, you know, there's... Like that's <laughs> trivia that maybe a lot of people wouldn't know. Um yeah. The, the idea of uh, March 25th being um, the date that we celebrate Easter, then it's nine months later that we celebrate the nativity. Right. And then and that, that being the birth of or the conception of, of the new man, right? Yeah. So um, according to Jacob Federici, is that there is a misunderstanding – uh, on a Jewish uh, tale, right? The, the Jews say that a prophet um, always, um, something along the lines of a prophet always dies on the day that he is born, right? Um, and the Christians uh, understood or may perhaps misunderstood something along that line that um, that a, a prophet is always uh, born on the day he's conceived or dies on the day he's conceived. Right. So, well, no, that doesn't count. No, that doesn't make sense. I don't remember. Right. But, the, but, the, the, but yeah, there's this idea that, um, uh, that they're doing some sort of theological math to get to the December 25th. Birthday. I mean, this is fourth century at this point, introducing yeah. this, um, celebration on December 25th. So this isn't yeah. something that... Go, go ahead. I've, I've actually seen exegetical arguments that that Christians did get the day right um, on December 25th. And the, the argument, the argument 
goes that um, every basically twice a year, right? One of the families would be called upon. One of the ironic families would be called upon to maintain the temple, right? Twice a year. Yeah. Right. Um, and they would be spread out across the Jewish calendar, right? And they would kind of take it in shifts, right? Because there's, you know, you didn't have one high priestly family taking care of, you know, the temple 24 seven, it was kind of broken up uh, yeah. amongst them. Right. And that based on uh, the lineage of John the Baptist, right. Um, you can kind of calculate when John the Baptist was born. And then from there calculate when, when Jesus was born. Um, and you can, you can, I, 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 I'll post a link if anyone's interested in that argument. Um, I mean, they, they, is it from John? Because it has all the feast days and all that. Well, I mean, also Luke, right? Because Luke, um, here you go. Yeah. Um, Luke uh, is the one who records. Here you go. There you go. Now you can you can think what you want about Dr. Taylor Marshall, but this is this is the argument that he's making. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think it's a decent argument. So. Um, and I think that there's a few other ones, but yeah, I think, I don't know. I tend to think, I, I tend to think the Christians understood, you know, when Jesus was born, because, um, we, we have this source, right. Uh, for the birth of Jesus, uh, Mary, <laughs> right. Mary, Mary knows when her son was born, you know, and, um, she passes that on, uh, I, I don't know why the early Christians would not know the birthday of Jesus. You know what I mean? You might have later justifications, right? But I think at root, I think they knew. Um, I mean, for crying out loud, we know where he was buried, you know? Um, Next to the Ark of the Covenant, below it. Yep. That's uh, <laughs> funny. We, yeah, my gosh. We, yeah. Uh, we specifically know the time that his father served. And we know when that was in the year, and when you roll the clock from that time to when John was born, from that from which you can calculate Jesus's birth date, and it ends up being somewhere at the end of just December, you know. Yeah, well, just to kind of maybe wrap it up here a little bit, I yeah, I, I think there's a really just sort of a, a mystical reading of. The, the, the biggest takeaway is um, this mystical understanding of how the church and Mary relate to each other. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think really that that's what he's bringing to light here. And also this connection of, I don't know if you will talk about this a little bit, the womb to, to tomb idea. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah for go, sure. You go, yeah, go ahead. Talk, talk about that a little bit. The womb. Yeah. To tomb. Yeah. So uh, what's very interesting. So we have, uh, the Virgin Mary, right? And the one that she is with is Joseph, right? Um, and she is, she conceives and she's, she's a virgin in her, at her conception, right? Her womb has never, you know, she's a virgin before the conception and, and after as well, right? And um, at the end of Christ's uh, life, when he was crucified and he was resurrected before his resurrection, um, he was laid into the tomb by another Joseph, right? This time Joseph of Arimathea mm -hmm. and Joseph of Arimathea had his own uh, family tomb, right? Um, and uh, it had never been used, right? It was going to be his own family tomb, but it had never been used. And so that's where they placed Jesus. And so you have the virgin womb of the Virgin Mary and the virgin tomb of this place. And what's interesting is the, the, stole, the stone is placed in front of the tomb, right? And if you understand how uh, early people understood the concept of virginity, right? They had an idea that um, what was happening the first time when there was a bleeding was that there was a, a puncturing, right, of a, uh, 
what do you call it? I guess a membrane or something, right? That caused the bleeding, right? Um, and so the idea that that the, the the stone seals the tomb, right? And you have this idea of the Virgin Mary and she her being uh, a virgin is is there. And then when Christ is resurrected, right? Mm -hmm. This Christ is resurrected. The stone isn't rolled away so that we can, uh, so that he can get out, right? <laughs> the stone's not rolled away so that he can get out, right? That the, the stone is rolled away because, um, uh, so that we can see in to the tomb that it's empty, right? So, but Christ exits the tomb, right? In the same way he kind of exits his mother's womb, right? Um, in a virgin way, in, in a way that does not um, violate her virginity. It's right? a sealed tomb. It's, a, it's sealed a sealed womb. It's a sealed tomb and a sealed womb. That's what's happening there. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Just that connection. Again, mystical, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, very mystical. These are, these are mist and then also uh, the greeting of, of Jesus outside of the tomb is Mary, a different Mary. Yeah, it's a different Mary. Ma Mary, yeah, uh, Mary still, you still, you got two different Josephs and you got two different Marys mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the womb to the tomb. Right, right. And Mary receives the word of God too. Mm -hmm. And in a sense becomes a mother to the disciples because she goes and she tells everyone else and for mm -hmm. them to believe, right? First one so, to hear the hear the word from Mary. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful. Very powerful stuff. Very interesting stuff. Yeah. Lots of connections. Yeah. Um I don't know if you want to post and if there's anyone who wants to ask questions or chat. Oh yeah, yeah. Up yeah. And, um, invite up. Yep. Yeah. Here we go. But, but yeah, that's that's essentially the show, guys. That's what, yeah. what we got for you on chapter four. For sure. And um, make sure you you go vote and make sure uh, you join the Discord that you like, that you subscribe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give a like, comment, and share thing, right? Um, Jeremiah, I'm glad that you uh, came in. I'm glad that um, I think this is the first time we've seen you comment. Um, so it was really cool to have you there. Uh, do us a favor if you're willing um, join the discord I think I've sent you a link um, but then also if you're interested you can hop in we can talk for a little bit uh, you don't have to be on cam if you don't want to be so we'll give you guys like three minutes or so to decide yeah yeah, yeah really enjoyed this it was really good oh lord have mercy yeah, so the last chapter, just to kind of while we're waiting, it's called Glorify God in Your Body. Yes. That's I, the last one. I think we should read the postscript too, though. You know? It's for the hardcore people. Huh? I mean, have you read a book if you haven't read a book? You know? It's pretty short. It's, yes. only, like, it's only like nine pages. So yeah, yeah, we could do that because he's got a big nice graph on here. Yeah, you know. Um I think we could probably take a picture of and post it know. on there. Yeah, post it on there. Um Jeremiah says he can't, so that's fine. Um, all right, guys, Godspeed, appreciate you, and uh we will talk soon. Um, I can't hang out in Discord tonight. Um I've got I've got a lot of stuff going on at home right now, but um I appreciate you guys and we will see you guys soon. Um, Cornell. Well, I, I want to talk to you briefly as we finish the stream. Bye, guys. Take care. Godspeed. See y'all. See you, man.